It's the great power of God. They were attentive to him because he had amazed them with his sorceries for a long time. Now, of course, the Bible doesn't go into a lots of details about what this sorcery is. Maybe he turned people into a newt. I don't know. Still, man, so few reference, um, acknowledgments of that reference. Um, then they got better. Um, but, so, thank you. That's a little better. Um, so, but, but, but what, what we see here is this is not, the Bible is not talking about magic tricks. S Simon didn't pull rabbits out of his hat. You're talking about a man who at some level had an ability to, in, to engage with a world that we cannot see and tap into some sort of energy or power or force or whatever you want to call it and through that process manifest some amazing acts physically before the people and, 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 and in such a way that he could connect it to the, the sorcery that he was practicing. Now, for us, that's really hard. If, I was, if, I, if someone were to claim to be a sorcerer, we would probably call mental health services. But, th but that's not the culture or the context in which we're reading this. In fact, we can't assume that things like magic and sorcery would have been looked upon with suspect in this culture because it wasn't. This is way before the scientific revolution, and so the explanations for the mysteries of the world primarily had to do with spiritualized explanations that were either addressed through one's religion or worship of God, or were addressed through some complicated and, and intense kind of um, system of attributing um, phenomena to spiritual beings. And those spiritual beings could be manipulated if you learned what they wanted if you understood the kind of sacrifices that they needed, or if you understood the kind of rules under which they, they were obligated to act, then you could use their power to, 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 to be manipulated to get what one wanted out of life. So not all forms of magic were considered bad in that ancient world. In fact, this will press a little bit of you a little bit too far, and it's just a side point, so don't get high-centered on this. We can certainly have a cup of coffee, and I can talk a little more about it, but I think it's important for us to, to really be honest about what's in Scripture because, in fact, the New, Tel the, the New Testament actually celebrates three astrologers. Not astronomers, astrologers. It actually celebrates three astrologers. It celebrates three, what we've come to call as three wise men. Those wise men were magi. Guess what word we get from the word magi? Magic. These, were, these three wise men were, were magi or astrologers who followed the star in order to find the infant Christ. We don't have time to talk about this, but it, it's fascinating because of the way we see a glimpse into the character and nature of God. Because we would have a really hard time with that. I mean, I couldn't even listen to ACDC music because I was a Christian and someone played it backwards and it went. And then they told me what it said, and then it was very clear. Mm, killing your old mother. Oh, there it is. So, oh, no, we can't blend that all together because garbage in, garbage out, right? Some of our most famous prophets were forced to learn the arts of other cultures. And God used them powerfully nonetheless to be beacons of light for Yahweh because they were faithful to him. So even in here, what we see, it's just amazing. Do I think that God's endorsing astrology? No, I am not. Um, what I am saying is this. It's amazing the way God finds people anywhere they're looking for him. And even if he doesn't necessarily endorse the system or the means that they are employing to search for him, He's a God that's big enough to not be offended by that, and he sees the heart of one searching. So he says, you know, guys, I'm not really into the whole astrology thing, but boom, here's a star. Read the signs, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you, I'll, I'll speak to you in the language that you understand so that I can point you to my son. 
And so, so, so even in our New Testament, we celebrate uh, these kinds of individuals. And in fact, if you'll notice in our text, the Samaritans gave source credit to God for the power that, that Simon displayed. So, so they're kind of quasi-religious. They're giving glory to God, and that's what this is all about. They said, look at this man. This man is the great power of God being made manifest. And religious people flock around men even today, who claim to be displaying the great power of God. So we're really not that far removed from this context. In this narrative, though, what's important to notice is this. The contrast that is revealed is the difference between the very two very different approaches to God. The contrast that is revealed in the story of Philip and the Samaritans, and Peter and John, and in the story of Simon, is a contrast of two very different approaches to God. And this is where we want to peer into their story, but also be making some some time to contemplate what it means for our story. Because you see here, magic is an inferior approach to God that seeks to manipulate God through the use of techniques and formula. This is not Harry Potter stuff. What's being contracted here is a different approach to God. Here, read it again, magic is an inferior approach to God that seeks to manipulate God through the use of techniques and formula. And Simon would have been a student of these techniques and these formula or formulae because they were often written down for the use of future practitioners. So this is where we kind of get all of our traditions of things like spell books and whatnot. Because as these practitioners learned how to manipulate the elements or manipulate the spirits, they would write down meticulously how they did that and then pass this secret knowledge on to other students that could then employ this knowledge so that they could continue in this practice. The key, though, is not, has nothing to do with any kind of spiritual relationship with a higher being or a higher spirit. You can bypass all of that, and instead of the relationship, you can just master the information. And then once you master the information, you can just do and utilize the power of the spirit in the original place uh, that, that it originated from. Anybody get a parallel with another narrative in the scripture? It's in Genesis chapter 3. It's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm telling you, this story will, is all throughout scripture. Instead of walking with God and learning life on his terms, I'll just go to the tree of knowledge of good and evil so I can figure out how to do what he does. That's all this is. This is what magic would have been. Learn the formula, learn the technique, learn the information, then you can master the deity. And we have to be honest with ourselves. How many of us grew up with a version of evangelicalism that promised just that? Don't watch the rated R movies unless they're about the passion of the Christ, then that's one exception. Don't go to dances. Or don't be too sensual when you dance. Here's one. Don't have sex before marriage. Then your Christian marriage will be blessed and easy. How many people became bitter about that one? A lot of you. I know because... For 20 years, my calendar has been filled up with meeting with folks that are in that place. Now, am I saying that the answer is to be, uh, practice immorality, and what's the word for fornication? That's the one I was looking for. That's got more punch to it. 
Am I saying the answer, hey, let's practice fornication and celebrate that? Absolutely not. It will destroy you. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is this. It is a mistake to think that we master obedience to Christ so that we can guarantee the blessing of God. And typically, we interpret that as whatever it is that makes me happy and serves my agenda. I'll get the dream job, the dream marriage, the dream children, as long as I master these things. We can't separate ourselves. We can't look in judgment to these people too much because a lot of us participate in the same things. Let me figure out what makes God happy so that he will make me happy. So that's, that's that same approach to God. And verse 12 says about the Samaritans, but, so we're creating a contrast. So, so at one time, Simon had all this influence, and then he began to lose this influence because of the work of Philip. So verse 12 says, but when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Do you see the contrast? Philip is not proclaiming formulas and techniques for how to manipulate God to get what you want. He is making a proclamation of what God has already done, and you are invited to participate in it. He's making the proclamation that the kingdom of God is here, and that means that not only are you free from the tyranny of sin, you are free from the tyranny of control. You are free of having to give yourself to this exhausting system of learning the formula and techniques to keep the deity happy. He is pleased with you. Jesus showed up to let you know. He put on a flesh coat so he could look at you face to face. And say, I am here as the manifestation that so loved the world that, that I'm here. He's given his only son. And so the kingdom is here. So he proclaims the kingdom of God. He proclaims the name of Jesus. And he says, it says here that as he did this, both men and women were baptized. Which means that they they believe. No, no, look at verse 12. It's very important. Verse 12 says, what did they do? They believed Philip. Because they believed Philip, they evidently responded in this initiation rite called baptism that says not only did they believe Philip, but they engaged in baptism as a way of identifying with this new kingdom of God movement that's taking their world by storm. So they both believe and they engage in, in, the, in the, at that point, rather primitive rite of initiation. And I say primitive in the most literal sense, not to be pejorative, because I think that if we simplified our initiations, it probably would be, we would probably benefit from that. So, so they believe and then they're baptized. And look at verse 13. Even Simon himself believed. And after he was baptized, Here's a contrast again. Samaritans believe and they're baptized. Oh, and also there's another example, and I'm going to call him out separately. Even Simon believed and he was baptized. More than that, he becomes a devoted disciple of Philip. After he was baptized, he followed Philip everywhere and was amazed as he observed the signs and great miracles that were being performed. He's amazed. He's probably even saying, look what God is doing through Philip. It's not like he's confused. So he enters into the amazement of the, of the Samaritans. Now notice a few things. First of all, Luke separates the story of Simon's conversion from that of the other Samaritans. And if you at all have a nerd in you, that makes you want to pause and go, huh, why did he do this? Because here's what he highlights. Men and women believe and they're baptized. Simon believes and is baptized and as an extra modifier, he follows Philip because the signs and miracles amaze him. So why does he separate Simon's story from the other Samaritans? I don't know exactly. I don't pretend to know all the mysteries of Scripture, but here is a possibility. Perhaps he is creating yet another contrast, because if you remember all throughout the 17 years of the book of Luke, and as we've broken down the book of Acts, what we remember is this. Luke loves to teach through contrast. 
So perhaps he's creating yet another contrast that reveals the difference between a true conversion and a false conversion. Well, wait a minute. This, che this church teaches about grace. You can't be talking about false conversions. Oh, yes, we can. We can at both celebrate the grace of God and have to say at the same time, make sure you actually enter into it. Not a pseudo grace that has no power to transform you. And let me be clear, we have never been talking about that kind of grace. I am sorry if you misunderstood and thought that's what we were talking about, but not once have we ever been talking about that kind of grace. We're talking about the gratuitous love and mercy of God that enters into the human soul and works about a great transformation. And so maybe he is creating this picture so that we can have the uncomfortable experience of looking into these two different approaches to God. Verse 14, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. After they went down there, they prayed for them so the Samaritans might receive the Holy Spirit because he had not yet come down on any of them. I'm sorry, Calvinists that have been told, no Holy Spirit, no belief. I don't know what you do th with this with your theological pipe, but this is what it says. They actually had real faith. They actually believed, and yet the Holy Spirit had not yet. So here they go. They act in their faith. They believe, but it says the Holy Spirit had not yet come down on any of them. Verse 16, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. There you go, Pentecostals. Affirmation of your tradition right there. Verse 18. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, give this power also, give me this power also that anyone I lay my hands Lay, lay, that anyone I lay hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Now that's a really interesting request. It doesn't even say necessarily that he asked to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, only the power to give the power of the Holy Spirit. Fascinating character, this Simon, in my opinion. Uh, so he says, give me this power so that anyone I lay my hands on can receive the Holy Spirit. This is gonna take my sorcery gig to a whole new level. But Peter told him, may your silver be destroyed with you. Now, notice what Peter is discerning. He is in that statement. He didn't just say, your silver is headed to destruction. He says, Simon, you are headed for destruction. The silver is following Simon. Simon's not following the silver. And so he says, May this silver that you tried to use to purchase the power of God, it's going to be destroyed with you, which means you are on your way to destruction, my dear fellow. Um, where were we? Thank you, verse 20. Verse 21, you have no part. Now, this is a frightening phrase. Look at this. You have no part or share in this matter because your heart is not right before God now this might make the part of your brain that has arranged your Christian faith according to simple evangelical formulas go and I hope so it's what I wanted to do because didn't he follow all the gig he followed the rules he listened he believed he was baptized and yet what Peter discerns is this your heart is not right before God Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, your heart's intents may be forgiven. So then he does give him the key. There is something, brother, that you can do. Seek the Lord yourself and ask him to forgive you. And look at Simon's response, verse 23. I'm sorry, verse 24. Verse 23 says, For I see you are poisoned by bitterness, 
and bound by wickedness. And Simon says, pray to the Lord for me, Simon replied, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. Do you see, this is the problem with formulaic approaches to God is we still are convinced we need a mediator. And if you have come alive with the grace of the presence of God and the forgiveness and the mercy of God that is extolled through the gospel, one of the foundational revelations that you must build your life upon is there is no need for a mediator. You are welcome to come before the throne of grace and find mercy in your time of need. And you should never take relational authority away from yourself and give it to any man. But Simon is so used to experiencing a mediated um, quasi-relationship with God that even when the invitation for him, like the woman with the issue of blood, to reach out and grab the hem of Jesus' garment himself, he says, no, would you do it for me? Would you pray for me? Peter says, you pray. Your heart could be forgiven. And Simon's reply is, you pray. Not necessarily that my heart is free, but that none of these consequences come on me. That's what I want to get away from. Pray that nothing that you said will actually happen to me. Verse 25, so after they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they traveled back to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now, in conclusion, that's a trick that doesn't work now that you have sermon notes. Let's take a moment and look into their story. First of all, let's separate it and look at the Samaritan story. The Samaritans embraced the Jewish Messiah because of the message of the spectacular displays of God's power. In the wisdom of God, the manifest presence of the Spirit was withheld at the time of the Samaritans' conversion. Now, I'm going to apologize and make explanation to my Calvinist brothers and sisters. Peter and John come from Jerusalem and pray for the Samaritans, and the Spirit descends. This is the order of things. Thus, the Samaritan mission becomes a unified and connected movement to that which began in Jerusalem. See, what we see here is the brilliance of God. He's not worried about working according to man-made systems of theology. He knows what he's doing, and what he knows is this. If Philip comes down here as a Hellenistic Jew, means a Jew of the dysphoria, not of the uh, pure original Jerusalem Jews, he comes down here as a Hellenistic Jew, he proclaims my kingdom, I descend upon these people, and all of a sudden, what do I have? I have a Hellenistic movement on my hands and a Jewish movement on my hands. We immediately, because the heart of man is so wicked, we immediately begin to divide and separate ourselves. So what God does is this. He withholds the Holy Spirit so that the representatives of the original Jerusalem movement, the big A apostles themselves, John and Peter, come down. They pray. That's the means that God sovereignly chooses to use to bring the Holy Spirit on Samaria. And now, what, you know the statement that's made? This is all one thing. This is all one family. Jews and Samaritans, what he did is he grabbed the demonic presence of years of prejudice by the chin, yanked it down, and crushed its head. There is no prejudice here. There is no separation. There is no us and them in this movement. We are one family. And to show you that, I am now connecting these two moves of the Spirit together. So these original ones that I chose will come down on the Samaritan believers. They will be the means through which I communicate my Spirit so that you will all see this is all a unified movement. And we're not told exactly what happened when the Spirit descended, but we are told that it was observable. 
It wasn't just something quiet that happened in the heart. It was something that could be observed. And so, oh my goodness, I'm robbing you all. There you are. <laughs> Far be it from me to rob you of this. <laughs> so we're not told exactly what that observation is. All we are told is that you could see it. So more than likely, this group also probably spoke with other tongues like the original group. Or maybe they stood up and prophesied. But whatever happened, it was a visible. It wasn't like mysterious. Oh, God works in mysterious, quiet ways that we can't always see. Yes, there's a truth to that. But sometimes and oftentimes, the quiet work of God ought to have a visible manifestation of fruit. And so that's what we see. It was clear that the Spirit had descended. All right, let's take a look at Simon's story. Simon seems to not have responded to Peter's warning at a personal level of ownership. There are disagreements about this. Some would say, yes, clearly Simon was a believer. He went through all the formulaic things that he's supposed to go through. He was baptized and he believed and he followed Philip around. Fine. I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't, I'm, I don't really going to spend any more of my life breath arguing with one. And maybe there's something I'm missing, and so we, we could discuss that. Lots of people believe that. I just don't think that the story bears that out. And, and Peter's response, it seems to me that he does not respond to Peter's warning at a personal level of ownership. He asks Peter to pray rather than responding to Peter's plea to repent. See verse 24, but we talked about that a lot when we read it. So here was Simon's journey. Simon believed. Simon was baptized. Simon followed Philip. Yet Simon had no part in what the Spirit was doing. See, Peter says this. He says it in verse 21. You have no part or share in this matter because your heart is not right before God. Now, why is it? Well, number one, your heart's not right before God. Therefore, repent. But verse 23, he says it even more. Why is his heart not right before God? Look at verse 23. I see you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by wickedness. It is such a tragic mistake for us to communicate that the gospel is about escaping the bondage of the afterlife and never proclaiming liberty from the bondage of this life. Simon believed, but he wasn't free. Now, I don't know all the spiritual and psychological reasons why that was so. I just know that this story tells me it is possible to go through all the motions and say the right things, and yet your heart still be bound. And if that's the case, that is not what God intends for you. He, he wants you to be invited into a life of freedom from bitterness and wickedness. Jesus' mission or his purpose is not to get you to heaven, but to make you And sometimes that takes more than a prayer at the altar at False Creek. Sometimes that journey might take you 40 years. But I promise you this, that's what he's after. Jesus is taking you by the hand and says, we're going to go on a, dirt, on a journey together. And there are going to be some wonderful oasis along the way. But a lot of it's going to be dry and hard. But don't worry, because I'm going to be right there with you. We're going to walk through those dry and hard places together. And we're going to make you whole again. I'm, I'm going to make you who I always knew you could be. That's the goal of Jesus. So let's think about this as we close here are some implications that I want to challenge this morning. And again, if my challenges anger you, that is not my intent. And I own that as my own lack of communication. So if they're bothersome, please 
let's skip email and text. Let's just get together and have a Reuben or a cup of coffee, and we'll talk about this. But I do think that we, ne we need to let the scriptures dictate the direction of our lives, not the organizational doctrines of men. So there's some implications from this story. Number one, we're not saved by what we believe. We're saved by the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. Changing beliefs is just a fruit of that. But we cannot make changing, we believe, the new formula and technique and incantation that will then make God favorably with us. No, the change in your belief status is just fruit of the work of the Holy Spirit. It is not the thing you contributed to earn your favor with God. We're not saved by what we say we believe. We're saved by the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. The question is not, and I've got some typos in the notes, I apologize. The question is not whether or not you believe in Jesus. The question is, do you obey Jesus? If I believe in Jesus and live my life for myself and my kingdom, refusing to die, I'm going to lose my life. I'm going to bring in the way of chaos. So it's not, I don't want to know whether or not you believe in Jesus. At some level, most people in America do. What's going to change your life is whether or not you obey Jesus. Whether or not you're actually making lifestyle adjustments in order to follow through in what he's called us to do. The question is not whether or not you believe correct doctrine or your interpretation of correct doctrine. The question is, does your life display the fruit of the Spirit? If your theology is great and the fruit is withering, there is a significant problem that needs to be addressed. It's amazing to me when Paul describes what a life of faithfulness looks like, he doesn't go into doctrinal statements. Now, what does he do? He, turn, he writes it in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control the law is not against such things let me say it very clearly if for whatever reason you have some sort of thinking or learning or understanding challenge in the mind you can still be transformed by the holy spirit God's not waiting for you to get all your belief systems in a row. He's looking for a response of faith and trust. And maybe you're confused about your doctrine, but your life, in, even in your confusion, is just manifesting love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Then bravo. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. You got a lifetime to get all this stuff figured out. And probably you'll slip over the other side and just feel like an idiot. But you know what? It doesn't matter because it doesn't hinder the work of the Spirit if you respond in faith. He's not looking for the most intelligent, the most talented, and the best looking, clearly. What he's looking for is whether or not you have the courage to become a child again and trust him. Can you see how the teaching of contemporary Christianity is not necessarily lining up with the teaching of Scripture? Salvation is not revealed by what you say you believe, but by the fruit of your life. We pay attention to our beliefs, so I'm not saying that beliefs are unimportant or that it's okay to have wrong beliefs. I'm not saying that. That can be very destructive. We pay attention to our beliefs so that we can be free of the destructive ideas and habits that hinder the life of the Holy Spirit. There are some bad beliefs and some bad ideas that if you believe them, you will cloud your vision, make it blurry so you can't clearly see the prompting and leading in the life of the Holy Spirit. And those need, you need to be free from those kinds of beliefs. I do believe that. 
But the story of Simon reminds us that the Spirit is sovereign. His work cannot be controlled or manipulated by the schemes of man. The work of the Spirit cannot be formulized. And you'll see my note, see addendum if time permits. So I'm learning and growing in my craft because I can see and behold, time does not permit. But if you're interested, look at the addendum. I think it's fascinating the way the book of Acts refuses to show us a formulaic way that people are saved. And you can, but, but, but don't do that now. Do that um, this evening, this afternoon over coffee. Simon reminds us that we can be enamored with the power of God without adoring the God of the power. When we seek the spectacular, we often miss the significant. If God is sovereign and there's nothing and it's all his work, then what can we do? I'll tell you what we can do. We can hope. We can pray. We can lay hands. And what I mean by that is prayer. My laying hands ministry is only appropriate for my wife, but you know what I mean. We pray. We pray for one another. We, we, we see what the, 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 the church has passed down to us. So we can pray. We can lay hands on people. We can, we, we, but we cannot force the work of the Holy Spirit. I can stand as a prayer team minister and stand with my brother who is in pain, and I can put my hands on him, and I can pray and ask God to do something. But none of this coming from me will change anything except for this. Maybe for today, what Adam needs is not some mystical touch of God that says something here, but maybe he needs this. And then all of a sudden, maybe this is the hand of God. But maybe this is the reminder. I'm right here with you, brother. My hand is on your shoulder. And we will ask God together to do a work in your life. I can't make it happen, but I certainly can be there and be the means through which God might do something that we either can't see or observe immediately, but we eventually see. We can be obedient to the mission of Jesus. It's not, and God's will is not ambiguous. Stop saying from this day forward that you just don't understand what God's will is. I will tell you. Or you can read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's, God's will is not mysterious and it's not hard, it's not complicated. Love, show mercy, be a good neighbor, take care of, your, uh, of, of those in need, and take care of your enemies who are in need. It, it's not that it's mysterious, it's just that we don't want to do it. It's, I'd rather it be mysterious than as clear as it obviously is. So, so, so what you can do is reorient your life, your life around being obedient to the mission of Jesus. Because as you do that, what will happen is this, the Spirit will meet you along the way. And you will encounter the work of the Spirit. We can order our lives around faithfulness to the way of Jesus. All of this is in our control right now. There is someone that you're judging, someone that you're bitter toward, someone that you hate. And if you want to, you can say, God, I choose to not hate. I choose to forgive. Now, I can't change my heart, so Holy Spirit, come because you've got to do what, for me what I can't do for myself. But what I can do is I can respond in obedience and choose to bless those who have hurt me. And I'm going to do that, but if it's going to be sustained, it will only be sustained by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. We can ask the Spirit to deliver us from our preoccupation with the spectacular and open our eyes to the presence of the significant. We can make choices to position ourselves to be part of the answer to our own prayers. The worship team comes forward, and as we come to a close, now you know it's for real because I called the worship team forward. What I want to do is I want to break this down. I don't want this to become ambiguous and so mystical that we don't make application because the simplicity is quite shocking. All I'm suggesting is as contemporary Americans, stop living your life for amusement. We are amusing ourselves to death. And we are the poorer for it. I would suggest that you proactively seek 
to move from amusement to engagement. And now I'm going to get up in everybody's business. Here are some things that I have found helpful. As a disciple of Jesus, turn off your screens. Turn them off. There's got to be moments in your day where a phone or a tablet is not directing your attention. Ask yourself, has your life become fruitless and futile because it's been built around unbridled streaming of show after show after show? Yeah, look, El Camino, the Breaking Brad movie, drops on Friday. I'm there, baby. I'm not trying to pretend that I'm something that I'm not. I want to see what's happened to Jesse since he last left Walter White. But what I'm saying is we have to be honest with ourselves about the way that directs our lives. And it's very easy to get into unbridled streaming to what you do is you go through your day looking forward for the moment where you can jump into a pretend world and see what's happening with someone else's exciting life. That's not what God has for us. Practice being present anytime you're with another human being. For that is holy ground. Don't try to rush past it. The closest you're ever going to come from a visible manifestation of God is the image of God in the person right in front of you. It's holy ground. It's fall now, my favorite time of the year. Build a fire. Take a moment to be proactively grateful for the people who are sitting with you. You see, this is the joy of Christ's community church. You might come and I say, read the Sermon on the Mount for 100 days. That's a challenge. Today, this week's application is this. Build a freaking fire. Just, just build a fire. Sit around it. And somewhere in that moment, look around that fire, whether it's one person or several, and enter into active gratitude for the people that are there enjoying that fire with you. Laugh. Make your partner their favorite meal or their, bever or their favorite beverage and tell them that you love them and that you appreciate them. Take a long walk alone or take a long walk with someone with whom you can enjoy a really good conversation. Not that fake junk. Not that stupid christian -y stuff. I'm glad you're blessed, but if you don't feel blessed, I want to hear about it. I want to know why you feel that way. Take some time every single morning to be grateful for your stupid little life. That's what it feels like. It's a stupid little life, God, but I'm grateful for every single moment. Let me not belittle it. Just here for a second. With a couple of generations, no one's going to know that you were here. But what you have is this eternal present moment. And you can enter into it. And you can wash over your soul. And you can be gripped in the magnificent bigness and beauty of it all and your heart can be full regardless of what's going on so your assignment this week is this and we're going to practice it so would you stand with me please for the next seven days starting with the, this afternoon take a moment wake up stretch let the dog out or whatever you people do with your cats. <laughs> Put your hand on your heart. Say this simple prayer. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Show me how to keep in step with you today. Cause my life to bear the fruit of the Spirit. 
that will nourish anyone with whom my life interacts today. Every morning, just put your hand on your heart and say that prayer. You're welcome here. I need you through the gospel in my life. I need you to show me how to keep in step with the Spirit. I want my life to bear fruit that nourishes. I don't want to be that judgmental presence that people dread see coming. If I have to speak hard truth, I want to do it in a spirit of love so that it's effective. The night that our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body given for you, broken for you, eat in remembrance of me. And he poured the wine and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, taken, shed for the forgiveness of sins, taken drink in remembrance of me. If you are here and you're new, you do not have to take communion, but you are welcome to. Uh, the ushers will lead people outside the outside aisles and direct the traffic. You can either remain in your seat or you can walk through and not take the elements. No one's going to give you a hard time or to judge you or anything. You're welcome to participate as the Spirit leads you.